Hello everyone and welcome to my talk which is about Bluetooth exposure notification security. This talk could also be summarized as follows. So first of all, exposure notifications as in the Google Apple API are very secure and battery friendly and please just use the Corona Warn app. This might be very confusing to most of you who are listening and know me since a while because I have been working on Bluetooth exploitation in the past and always told everyone like Bluetooth is insecure. So you might wonder how does this align? Why am I now here telling you that Bluetooth exposure notifications are secure? So, well, it's a pandemic. So instead of just criticizing solutions, we should also look for solutions that work. So instead of ranting, work on something that helps everyone. So the first question that many people ask uh, uh, do we even need a smartphone app to fight the pandemic? What we can say, well, it's December. Exposure notifications were introduced in June and we still have Corona. It still exists. So it didn't help to fully um, fight them and probably it won't stop Corona. But let's look at this from another perspe uh, perspective. So first of all, if you have an app and get the warnings, we can do more accurate testing. And that's very important because even now we are still low on tests. We cannot test everyone. We only test people with symptoms. And that's really an issue because people can inf in infect other people prior to symptoms. And they could even infect others without having symptoms. So there are asymptomatic cases. And these can be found with the Corona Warn app. And also this can encourage manual contact tracing because official health authorities, they are not able to make physical and manual contact tracing anymore. So um, you need to ask your friends and so on if your app turns red and then you might find cases even if they forgot to tell you. Of course, this all doesn't replace um, washing your hands, wearing a mask, physical distancing and so on. So of course you still need to take these measures. But even if you just inform a few people, every prevented infection actually saves lives. So it's very important to have an app like this. And the next question is, well, is there something better than Bluetooth? So if we want to look for a solution to build an app that supports exposure notifications and prevent infections, how could we build it? So we actually need something that somehow measures proximity or location. And in a smartphone, we have various technologies that support that. So there is GPS, there's Bluetooth, there's LTE and 5G, there's Wi-Fi, there's ultra wideband. You probably never heard of this. There's audio, there's a camera. You could use all of this. And the reason why you can use this to measure a distance or a direction um, is that on the physical layer you have a waveform and this waveform first of all has an amplitude and with a distance this amplitude gets lower so this also means that the signal strength is lower and you also have a phase that is changing um, with the distance. So these are all properties that you can measure on the physical layer on a raw waveform and some of this information is also sent to upper layers. And the most obvious one is the signal strength. So it's a physical layer property that you can measure. And it's also sent to the upper layers on most protocols for simple things like determining uh, how strong a Wi-Fi is so that your device can actually pick the strongest Wi-Fi access point and so on. So the signal strength is very essential and sent to upper layers in most protocols. You could actually even do a precise distance measurement, but for this you need the raw waveform and that's not supported by most chips. There are a few chips that can do that. So for the precise distance measurement, you actually need to send uh, a signal and send it back and measure the round trip time of the signal. And this is, for example, done to determine if your Apple Watch can unlock your MacBook. And the third option is that you can even measure a signal direction. This actually needs multiple antennas to do some sort of triangulation of the signal. And this is not supported by mouse chips because you not just need the support in the chip, but also the multiple antennas. But uh, with this, you can, for example, do things like on some iPhones, you get some airdrop direction of the other iPhone and so on. So you can have a direction shown on your device of a signal. 
When it comes to location, the most obvious choice for many people or the intuitive choice would be GPS. And GPS, well, the signals are sent by satellites and they orbit Earth at more than 20,000 kilometers. So they are like very, very distant. And until the signal arrives on your smartphone, there is a lot of attenuation. So even if there are like just a few buildings or if you are indoors or something, but already a few buildings are sufficient to make the location imprecise and indoors, it doesn't work at all. But indoors, we have the highest risk of infections. So uh, GPS is not really helpful here. The next option would be signals from LTE, 5G and so on. So here you have some senders and with you, you actually change cells with your smartphone. So here we have one cell and while you move, you move to another cell. And this is some movement that you do and you can measure the changes between the cells. And this actually has been used by phone providers in Germany to determine how effective the lockdown rules are. So with this, you can actually see if people move more or less than uh, prior to the pandemic and so on, or how effective the rules are and so on, these are not very precise statistics. So this is nice to have those very broad statistics for a lot of people, but it's not uh, useful to determine who you were meeting. And another option is Wi-Fi, but for Wi-Fi you have another issue. So. Um, Wi-Fi is depend on access points and so on, and you can scan for access points. And of course, most smartphones also support that you spawn your own Wi-Fi access point, and then you could scan for this, but then you can no longer use your Wi-Fi because you can only join one Wi-Fi or spawn one Wi-Fi access point and so on. Um, and this really doesn't work. There are some manual specific additions that would allow distance measurement, but it's not in most devices, it's not accessible through APIs and stuff like this. So you cannot use Wi-Fi because of how it works and how it is built into smartphones. The best option for precise measurement is audio, because even if you don't have access to the chip or any API, what you have here is that you have a, a sender or like um, a speaker and a microphone and they send a wave and you can measure this wave. So even without any lower layer access to some firmware to some chip, you can have this very precise measurement. But here the issue is that it means that you need access to the microphone. So an app would need to run in foreground with a microphone all the time, this drains battery, and even worse, it means that you have a permanent spy in your pocket. So you have a governmental app that would listen to your microphone all the time, and many people don't want this. Then there is an option that you probably have never heard of, ultra wideband. So that's coming to the newest generation of iPhones. And so far, it's not used for many features. It's just something that can also determine a direction of a signal because it's, uh, it's using multiple antennas and so it can show you in which direction another device is. But since it's only in a few devices, it's nothing that's useful for the general public. So it's a nice feature, but we are just a few years too early for it. And of course you could use the camera. Similar to the microphones, you could of course um, record everything with the camera, but that's probably not the solution that you want. So more likely um, you could actually use it to log into location. So you scan a QR code and then register that you are in a restaurant or that you are meeting friends. So this is what the camera ideally should be used for. And that would be a nice addition to the warning apps. And what's left? Well, there's Bluetooth. Bluetooth actually sends signals at 2.4 gigahertz like Wi-Fi and 2.4 gigahertz has a very big issue because it's attenuated by water and humans are 60% water. So um, the measurement is a bit imprecise, but I mean, 40% of the human are stupidity. And that's also an issue because humans are not using the Corona Born app at all. That's even worse. And well, what else is there? Um, the next issue is that the chips vary and the antenna position varies and so on. So you actually have the issue that the measurements are not the same on each smartphone model. So it might be the same signal, but different measurement. And for this, 
first issue with the different measurements of the same signal, um, we already have something that's built into the API, the official Google Apple API, and they include the transmit power per device model and so on, which is um, a slight risk for privacy, but overall it has a very um, good compensation here. So they said that this is better to use and have a little bit less privacy. Something else that you could use are active data connections over time to track the average signal strength. But that's worse because the active data connection means that you have data that's being exchanged between two devices. And this is a risk for exploitation. So exploits need some exchange of data and this would be a risk for security. And another thing that you could add is the accelerometer. So depending on how you hold your smartphone, you can actually determine by the accelerometer if it's in your hand, in your pocket and so on, and then compensate for this in the measurements. But the issue here is that the accelerometer also is able to determine if you are running, walking, how many steps you are walking and so on. So it's a huge privacy impact to access the accelerometer. And last but not least, there is uh, the angle of arrival. And that's something that's supported since Bluetooth 5.1, but it's an optional feature in the Bluetooth specification. So no smartphone has it yet. So you cannot actually do a specific measurement of the angle of another device. So that's pretty sad. And well, so everything that improves those measurements on Bluetooth is always at the cost of privacy, security and battery life. So just considering how it's currently done in the API, it's pretty good. And to sum this technology round a bit up, well, so even though Bluetooth is not perfect, Bluetooth Low Energy is really the best technology that we have in all smartphones or all recent smartphones. And with this, we can build exposure notifications. So yeah, even though Bluetooth might not be optimal, it is still a winner. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know Bluetooth is dangerous and so on. So let's discuss this a little bit. Uh, so actually during 2020, a lot of newspapers were trying to reach me and said like, hey, Jeska, you have been working on Bluetooth security. So please, please tell us how bad the current state of Bluetooth security is. And then I was like, yeah, I don't really want to tell this because, you know, Bluetooth is a wireless protocol that transmits data and that has certain risks, but so has everything else. Uh, so yeah, and then they didn't print this. I mean, it's really not a nice headline to print. Bluetooth is a wireless protocol that transmits data. Um, yeah, and then they were like, you know, I'm not using the exposure notifications because I'm using an outdated smartphone that does no longer receive security updates. And then I'm like, Ooh, yeah, so I mean, no security updates. That's not just an issue for Bluetooth. That's an issue for everything. Like if you browse unicorn pictures on the internet or receive mails or I don't know what, um, maybe just get a new smartphone if you are very concerned about the data on your smartphone. And also something that you shouldn't do to a journalist when they ask you this is tell them, so you have an outdated smartphone. Are you just calling from a number that belongs to this smartphone? <laughs> but yeah, so uh, just, just don't discuss this because it's a very general issue that's not specific to Bluetooth. And well, something that's a bit more specific to Bluetooth is that, well, you can build worms with this. So a device can be a master or a slave in the Bluetooth terminology. And so um, a master can connect to slaves and a smartphone can switch roles, which means that it can receive a worm and then become a master and transmit a worm to another slave and the slave then becomes a master and so on. So it's warmable. But to have a very good worm, you would actually need an exploit that runs on a recent iOS and a recent Android version and it is very reliable. So it should be a very good exploit on all platforms. And if someone had such an exploit, they would probably not use it to disturb exposure notifications, but they would sell it for the price that is currently available on the market. The highest price, of course, because uh, probably you don't have that many ethical concerns um, instead of reporting it. But yeah, so that would be more of the scenario here. 
Then also people say, I turn my Bluetooth off because Bluetooth drains battery. But you know, Bluetooth doesn't drain a lot of battery, especially Bluetooth low energy. So Bluetooth low energy is a technology that can uh, power even small devices like item finders of this size. So if you have a battery uh, button cell of, of this size and then have like a device of slightly larger, like a Bluetooth finder of this size, um, they can run with this button cell for a year and you charge your smartphone daily, your smartphone has much more battery capacity than just one button cell. So yeah, go for it. It really doesn't drain battery, especially because you also have combo chips. And if you have Wi-Fi enabled, then Bluetooth really doesn't add anything to this. Another argument might be that Google and Apple are always stealing our data. And if they now do the contact tracing, this means that they are stealing data, but in fact, the exposure notification API was renamed because it really is just about exposure notifications. It's not about a contact log. And this means that this API is not collecting any data about your contact trace. And well, it's good and bad in terms of um, they are preventing a centralized collection by everyone. So not just by health authorities, they just prevent it by everyone and including themselves. So there is, just no data collection, so you cannot complain about this. So yeah, after saying this, you might ask me if I had now just said like that uh, Bluetooth is not dangerous at all, but you know, Bluetooth is still a wireless protocol that transmits data. So uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's still somewhat dangerous. So if you look at the Apple ecosystem, what you have is um, a feature set called continuity framework. And this does a lot of things like uh, some copy paste, airdrop, handoff whatsoever. So data that's being exchanged and uh, all of this continuity part here, it all works with BLE advertisements and then actually Wi-Fi or AWDL for the data transfer. So you have a lot of BLE advertisements going on if you already are using iOS and other Apple devices. And exposure notifications, they really are just a tiny additional thing here. So it's just yet another feature that's based on BLE advertisements. So it's nothing that adds a lot. And you also need to know that um, the exposure notifications don't have a lot of logic. So you just receive them, you don't answer to them and so on. So it's really a very harmless feature on top compared to the other services running. Now let's look into an Android example, which is a recent Bluetooth exploit. Um, so bugs like this exist and this is not just specific to Android. It can also be on iOS and it's also not specific to Bluetooth because we have bugs all the time. So um, if you are using software, if you are not updating it, um, there might be bugs in it or there might also be bugs in it that have not been seen for a while. So despite they should have been fixed and so on. So this just exists whenever you're using software. And also those bugs often depend on certain hardware and software versions. So for example, this exploit only works on Android 9 and older because it requires a very specific implementation of memcopy because the memcopy is called with a length argument of minus two and it has different behavior on different systems. And last but not least, but this, this um, exploit actually needs to run for something like two minutes because you need to bypass ASLR over the air. So you need to be in proximity of a vulnerable device for a while if you are an attacker. And now people say, yeah, but it's special because this kind of bug, it's formable. Yeah, that's true. So you could build a Bluetooth form with this, but what does it look like? So first of all, um, the devices are losing uh, connections. So you don't have a full mesh, but you have like some connections here and there, and you have a worm spreading somewhere and so on and so forth. But the attacker actually needs some control server. So no matter what the attacker wants to achieve, like steal data or um, do some Bitcoin mining or something. In the end, you need to have some feedback and control server in the internet to have a communication or also if something goes wrong with your exploit to, to stop it or something, you need this back channel despite you have a wireless channel because your wireless channel is not permanent. 
And the next challenge here is that your exploit needs to be very reliable. So um, it means that if you actually produce a crash and if you have a worm that spreads very fast and that spreads a lot, then you have the problem that if it's not 100% reliable, you would get crashes and that are reported to Apple or to Google. And this is an issue because once a bug is detected, it means that Apple and Google will update their operating system and your bug is gone. So all your exploit development um, was just for nothing, your exploit is gone. And well, that actually means that if an attacker would want to build a worm, they would probably just use some outdated bug. And as I said, bugs happen, so they, they are there every few months or years, it depends. You would have a bug that works for a worm and then the attacker does not have the risk of losing a very like unique bug that is worth a lot of money if they use an old one but it also means that all the devices that get updates are safe from the swarm so it really depends on what the attacker wants to do so what i think is more likely so instead of building a worm what are attack scenarios well um if you think about bluetooth exploits the worm needs a lot of reliability and so on um, and you have this risk of, of losing the exploits so probably the attacks are a bit more targeted and require the physical proximity of those targets so stuff that i would say is very realistic would be like if you have some airport security check or if um, like an attacker is close to certain buildings like company buildings or your home or something to steal certain secrets or also from the government if there are protests and the government does not want them or want, like, wants like identities of the, pro the pro uh, protesters or something, this would be um, an option. But the worm, as I said, is uh, yeah a bit, let's say, not so plausible. And the next thing is, so exploit development means that if you want to develop an exploit for recent iOS and Android, um, then this is a lot of work and well, your enemy might be able to afford this. And in this case, they can also use it multiple times. So as long as the bug does not leak and is not fixed, they can reuse the exploit. So it's a one-time development cost, but if you think you have enemies like this, then probably use a separate smartphone for exposure notifications and keep your smartphone up to date and so on. Or if you're very, very, very afraid of attacks, then maybe just don't use a smartphone because Bluetooth is really not the only way to hijack your smartphone. So um, you could still be attacked just by messengers, browsers, other wireless technologies like LTE and so on. So. Uh, it's just a risk that you have and that happens and that's not specific to Bluetooth. Anyway, let's go to a few implementation specific details. So um, if you want to understand the exploitation background and why I think that the Bluetooth exposure notification API as it is, is very secure. So first of all, the API does Bluetooth address randomization. So that means these addresses are randomized and not connectable and you cannot connect to them as an attacker. And also there is no feedback channel because of this non-connectable property. And it means that usually your smartphone is configured in a way that it doesn't um, announce any connectable addresses. It only has this random addresses and this is really hard for exploitation. So you need to know the correct address of a smartphone to send an exploit to it. And it's not sent over the air. So you need to um, decode packets, for example, if you are in parallel listening to music or something, you could extract the address from this, but it's very hard to achieve this. And another part is that especially Apple is tremendously restricting their Bluetooth interfaces. So smartphone apps cannot use Bluetooth for arbitrary um, features that are available within the Bluetooth specification. And this means that um, this is good for your privacy. So for example, it's hard to build something like a spy in your pocket on, on um, iOS because there it's hard to run an app in the background that does all the tracking via Bluetooth and so on. 
And the other way around, it means that if there are apps that do exposure notifications or contact tracing, and they are not based on the official, official API, um, actually these apps are very exploitable because they use active connections, they run in the foreground, they actually um, are logging stuff that should not be logged. So probably don't do this and don't trust those apps that are not using the API. Another issue might be privacy. So first of all, there's a random identifier that stays the same for a while. But uh, as I said, on iOS, you have the continuity framework and it does the same. So at least on Apple devices, this really doesn't make a big difference. And if you think a bit broader than Apple, well, first of all, there's the signal strength. And if you compare this like to other um, technologies that are wireless, like Wi-Fi and LTE, there you also have signals with a signal strength and maybe uh, changing address and so on. You can always triangulate signals. So if you don't want to be tracked, you would also need to disable Wi-Fi and LTE. Another very important part about the security assumptions is the server infrastructure. So there are two types of server infrastructure. And first of all, you have one for the centralized approach which is also known as contact tracing. And in the centralized approach, the server knows everything. So the server knows who was in contact with whom and for how long. So for example, Alice met Bob for 15 minutes, but also Alice met 10 other people on Tuesday or something so that you actually have a record log of who met whom. And now the server can actually tell specific people after someone got a positive test and so on. Um, for how long uh, this was. The server can still censor some of the information it sends out to specific persons, but it has a lot of information internally. So this means if this server is run by some governmental health authority, that all the users have to trust this authority a lot with their contact history. And the other approach, are decentralized exposure notifications. So the server has a list of pseudonyms and positively tested users, um, but these are just pseudonyms, not uh, the exact times and exposures. And everyone can download this list and compare it to a local list. So you just have a local list on your smartphone who you met and you can compare the list with pseudonyms that are on the server. And this means that everyone could even opt out to publish these pseudonyms and you don't share your list to anyone. So why is this good or bad? Well, um, the governmental health authorities don't get any contact tracing info in the decentralized approach. And this might be an issue because this means that the government does not have any statistics about spreaders or effectiveness of the app. We cannot measure how much the app actually helped. We cannot measure how many infections were prevented by telling people to go into quarantine or to get a test and so on. But on the other hand, it means nobody is getting this data. So neither Apple nor Google nor governments, nobody is getting the data. And there is no gain from attacking the servers because they don't have any private information. And there's also no privacy impact from using the app. And in the end, if you get a positive test, even then you can choose to not share the result if you think it's an issue to disclose your pseudonyms. And I mean, ideally, many people should share their result, but you don't have to. And I want to show you a few attacks on exposure notifications because some people said like exposure notifications are very, very, very insecure. So let's look into attacks that have been publicly discussed on those exposure notifications as they are implemented now. And please note that many of these attacks are not specific to Bluetooth, but they are specific to everything that's somehow wireless and somehow a notification. So um, let's look, let's take a look. So the time machine attack, this one is quite interesting. The assumption here is that someone can change the time on your smartphone and then replay outdated um, tokens so that you would think like you met pseudonyms in the past that were already known to be tested positive and because your smartphone also is in the past it would accept those tokens and lock them and then if you compare them to the server later on 
uh, you think that you were po in positive in contact with positive users and so on. But please note that spoofing time is very, very hard. So if someone can spoof time, it means they can also break other things like TLS. And I mean, if I had a time machine, then I would just travel back to a time prior to 2020 or something instead of faking a few exposure notifications. The next attack is the wormhole attack. So imagine that like this one would be one shopping center, then another shopping center, and maybe up there a police station or something like this. Um, how does that work? Well, if you wormhole them and put them together, then the chance of getting a positive exposure notification in the end is very high. So you increase the chance of having positive exposure and this exposure, of course, was not real. So it's a uh, forwarded exposure. And because of this, in the worst case, you would do more physical distancing, more testing, maybe also start to distrust the app a little bit, but it doesn't really harm the overall system. So the amount of record on the server with the positive tests is not increased because only confirmed positive cases are uploaded to the pseudonym list and those who are just here and get a notification are not uploaded. And also to have such a deployment, so to have this wormhole and the wormhole that scales, you need a lot of devices that forward the notifications and uh, in public spaces. So it's not that easy to implement this. The last attack is the identity tracking attack. So let's say you have those pseudonyms, the pseudonyms, they change over time and you're moving through a city and there are uh, multiple devices that are observing your pseudonym changes. So of course you can then start tracking users. This again requires a very large scale installation. And the issue is also that if you are scared of this type of attack, then you would also need to disable Wi-Fi and LTE and so on because you can always triangulate signals. So ideally, if you don't want to be tracked, turn off wireless technologies. This is really not specific to Bluetooth at all. So yeah, all those attacks, they are valid, but um, to deploy them, like to have records of export notifications that you can then replay with time travel or a wormhole or also some tracing of IDs, you really need a large scale installation of something like Raspberry Pis throughout a city and many, many, many devices. So this would also work in any other wireless ecosystem, but okay. Um, but if you would roll out such an installation, also keep in mind that you could instead just deploy something like a lot of devices that have microphones or cameras and Wi-Fi and so on and track a lot of other things. This needs to happen in public spaces. So I don't know, next to bus stations, shopping centers and so on. And well, if you have such an installation, then really just tampering with exposure notifications of Bluetooth is not your main concern. The sad reality might actually be that we already have a lot of surveillance everywhere. So we have a lot of cameras in public spaces. So this is not the part that I would be afraid of. Uh, I mean, I would be afraid of public surveillance, obviously, but not uh, about Bluetooth surveillance in particular. So let me conclude my talk. The BLE advertisements are really the most suitable technology that we have in a smartphone to implement export notifications, and they are available on recent smartphones on iOS and Android. They are very secure, privacy preserving, battery friendly, and also scalable. And Keep in mind, every prevented infection saves lives and also prevents long-term disease. So this is really a thing to use, even if it does not work 100%. And with this, let's start the Q&A and discuss whatever you like, Bluetooth forms and so on. Thanks for listening.